It's early 2022 and cryptocurrency has lost a significant amount of momentum. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many mainstream coins have lost 30% or more of their value from the last year. However, NFTs have not. Non-fungible tokens have more or less sustained their value across the board, and one particular NFT has made a tremendous surge in value, the Bored Ape Yacht Club. The apes are being purchased by celebrities and entrepreneurs at an increasingly expensive rate, but why? What makes Basie tokens so valuable, and what does it mean for the future of NFTs? Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and we're back to have another discussion revolving around NFTs. There will be details I revisit from the previous episode, so I strongly encourage you to watch explaining what an NFT is and how it affects you. It provides important context to the conversation we'll be having in this one. Much of our investigation will focus on the Bored Ape Yacht Club, but we will also examine how NFTs are evolving from a functional standpoint. So with that being said, let's get into it. In April of last year, Gargamel and Gordon Goner, recently discovered to be Florida residents, Greg Solano and Wiley Arano, conceptualized and launched the idea of the now popular NFT. We will still use their pseudonyms considering most of their direct quotes cite them that way. The Bored Ape Yacht Club was created by four friends who set out to make some dope apes test our skills and try to build something ridiculous. But what is it? Bored Ape Yacht Club is a collection of 10,000 unique ape NFTs that live on the Ethereum blockchain. Their website gives a concise description of the ape's variety. Each Bored Ape is unique and programmatically generated from over 170 possible traits, including expression, headwear, clothing, and more. All apes are dope, but some are rarer than others. It would be similar to any other collector pursuing unique features, like how a collector looks for rubber tires on a Hot Wheels car or a comic book collector searching for the first comic. Monetary value of the apes are derived from the rarity of their attributes. The artistic design grew under the leadership of all-seeing Seneca, an Asian-American artist recognized as the Silver Cube winner of Art Directors Club 100th Annual Awards and entered into the Gutenberg Museum. Suffice to say, this woman is most certainly known for her art. She clarifies in the Rolling Stone that she was not the sole illustrator of the art, but the body art is her exact design. Seneca laments the fact that despite its global popularity, not many people truly know that she has actually made them. Now, briefly diverting from NFTs, name recognition is a vital asset to artistic success. Let's take JK Rowling as an example. Before she was ostracized for the anti-trans social media commentary she provides, she was the globally popular Harry Potter author. After her Harry Potter series, she wrote a novel called The Cuckoo's Calling under the pseudonym Robert Galbraith. In March, 2014, it was revealed that Rowling was in fact the real author and sales shot up 507% in the month after. I give that comparison to say that name recognition is a significant component to an artist's value, not to mention the value of their art, but that's strictly in the creative realm. Solano and Arano, AKA Gargamel and Gordon, haven't had any reported benefits from their identities being disclosed in February. But back to Seneca, during the interview, she adds that while she couldn't reveal her financial specifics, in her words, her compensation was not ideal. The world of art and NFTs continue to be a sensitive subject and we won't pretend that this young industry has this all figured out. The argument that NFTs exploit artists is not made without merit. And in this case, it seems the lead artist got the smallest piece of the pie despite bringing life to the very product worth over a billion dollars. All Seeing Seneca did jump into the NFT market herself, selling a few of her creations for a far lower value despite her chimps flourishing. To go along with Seneca's vision, the Bored Ape Yacht Club have an interesting dystopian-ish backstory told by Gordon Goner in the New Yorker article. The year is 2031. The people who invested in the early days of cryptocurrency have all become billionaires. Now they're just fucking bored. What do you do now that you're wealthy beyond your wildest dreams, Goner said. You're going to hang out in a swamp club with a bunch of apes and get weird. Why apes? In crypto parlance, buying into a new currency or NFT with abandon, risking a significant amount of money is called aping in. We also just like apes. Building an NFT around a science fiction concept that could potentially come true? No wonder their idea piqued the interest of consumers. The satirical, if not cynical concept led to the first wave of popularity. From its inception, Basie found a high demand. All 10,000 apes sold within the first 12 hours, each costing $190. Similar to finite cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum, the limited number of Bored Ape NFTs drove up its value. 
If someone wanted to have an ape, they'd have to buy it at a higher price. The more people that buy, the higher its price goes up. Rinse and repeat until we have its value as of last month, averaging $200,000. But there are plenty of limited NFTs out there that haven't increased in value, let alone to the level of the bored apes or a cyberpunk, which apes surpassed as the highest valued mint. What makes this unenthused face so polarizing and compelling? Why would people pay a fortune just to have one? Some would argue that the quality of art has improved as mints grow in popularity and that the digital art platform has made progress as a viable form of investment. While both answers are a legitimate possibility, they are not the reason why apes have taken over. The truth is, bored apes are not even about the art itself. Now, before we get into the details, I want to say that there are people out there who are genuinely compelled by a bored ape they relate to, and they purchase the art on that factor alone. For other buyers and investors, bored apes is less than art and more about cultural shift. In a very literal sense, it's a digital ID and social status symbol. Now, there is an ongoing conversation about the potential of internet security and NFTs, as well as the potential of Web 3.0, which would use blockchain as the foundation. The debate of Web 3.0 has enough depth that it would take a whole other episode if we wanted to cover it. But if Bored Apes aren't purchased for the art, then why would anyone bother? The answer is in the name, the Bored Ape Yacht Club. The brand is built on its social exclusivity. Early on, the founders wanted to build a sense of community and identify with the mint. The home website describes it perfectly, and it says, when you buy a Bored Ape, you're not simply buying an avatar or a provably rare piece of art. You are gaining membership access to a club whose benefits and offerings will increase over time. Your bored ape can serve as your digital identity and open digital doors for you. Some entities in the crypto world have tried to turn their token into a lifestyle, but none have done it as successfully as Basie. Part of that is because of the benefits offered. And first we're gonna take a look at the NFT's party life because that's a thing. Owners of the Mint began social gatherings on October 31st, 2021, starting with the ApeFest, a Basie exclusive event following the NFT New York City conference. There haven't been many yacht parties yet, so the sources have been somewhat limited. The first party does give us an idea as what to anticipate as these gatherings expect to continue. Jessica Klein of Input Magazine calls her experience at the event in great detail. Members gathered around in large droves demanding to get the yellow wristband required to enter the party. They're described as loud, excitable, and involved with their ape. And to me, there is some kind of humorous irony in being exhilarated by a blase, disinterested monkey that's tired of their life and loafing around, just being weird as they say, but I don't know, that's just me. The reporter talks about a distinctive feature in the event, the clothing. Basie members eat bananas, seriously, and wear branded sweatshirts to show that they belong. Some are dressed in leather jackets or Hawaiian shirts that match their cartoon apes outfits so fellow club members can recognize them in real life. I found it interesting that the author of this piece opines, it's a great time to be an ape. That's the phrase used in lieu of, it's a great time to own an ape. I believe Klein made that distinction on purpose. The people that own these NFTs bought into the idea that they're part of something. Many on Twitter have the ape as their profile picture because of this fact. While the nature of social media is historically vain and fickle, having this NFT represent you or vice versa symbolizes your investment into the community. While the Yacht Club is an exclusive group, they paint themselves as less prestigious than the recently popular CryptoPunk. Today, the punks are for the art world snobs. The apes are for the sneakerheads and music fans. We will go deeper into the marketing aspect later, but for now, let's get back to the party. The clothing of choice for the partygoers is a sweatshirt. The blue shirt priced at $400 was a display of NFT savvy, or at least being knowledgeable of bored apes. Black sweatshirts were exclusive, proof that you were an ape. Since ApeFest started on Halloween, they also held a costume contest. And wouldn't you know, most of their outfits were just dressed up as their ape. And the winner of the contest is Ape1798, now named Jenkins. Jenkins ends up becoming an important chimp in the Basie infrastructure, and we'll explain why in just a moment. After a few days, the venue moves into a large warehouse where an epic party is held, as they say. The event is headlined by names like comedian Chris Rock, Lil Baby, Questloves, Aziz Ansari, Beck, and The Strokes, and not in that order. And it's everything you pretty much would expect in a highly popular concert. The Strokes, the main show, play music that fits with the theme of the NFT, and all the partygoers immerse themselves in the moment, either hopping in place with their own veritable mosh pit or swaying back and forth, reminiscent of their billionaire avatar. And after the concert, that's it. It was just one big party. Gordon Goner and Gargamel are also there, socializing with the apes and admiring their art while keeping secret their hand in creating it. Jessica Klein expressed disappointment, but offers interesting insight into the whole event. Maybe the prototype for Web 3.0 talking about Bay C isn't taking place in the political sphere, but the less consequential entertainment space. 
The real world sucks right now, so why not be in a metaverse where you, your friends, and Steph Curry are all members of the coolest club possible? To say that the 2020 decade has started off rocky is a massive understatement, and we've had a global pandemic impact the world, and the military actions going on in Eastern Europe has everybody on edge, which I think is my time to point out, um, <clears throat> fuck Russia, fuck Putin. Anyway, the past five years have been tumultuous and warrants for even more screen time than we want to give. So for that, I apologize, but while I wouldn't suggest that people pay a fortune as a form of escapism, it has to be an alluring element to some. The social construct of Basie is juxtaposed. The celebrities coming in generally aren't as knowledgeable of NFTs or the blockchain in general. The people we considered the highest in social status, the actors, the athletes, the musicians, are the low men and women on this veritable totem pole. To digging for Doge, an ape at the party, NFTs like Basie, even the playing field, He adds, all these big companies and celebrities entering the space, they have real world clout, but they're clueless here. Some big hotshot comes to talk to me about NFTs, it shrinks them down to size because they don't know what they're talking about and I do. It's back to the old adage, knowledge is power, which is true, especially in this new crypto world. I do believe that plays a part, but I don't know if digging for Doge's viewpoint is completely true, considering that some of these companies and celebrities contribute to driving up the apes price as well. But again, that's just my opinion. Have you noticed that? for a little bit, I really haven't mentioned actual NFT or blockchain technology. I haven't even talked about its financial implications either. In fact, I haven't said much of it at all. Today's episode has focused on the intangible elements behind the apes, the storytelling, social constructs, and live action role-playing. Remember in the first episode, I talked about Mr. Cuddles the bear and the difference between dollar for dollar and Mr. Cuddles versus other teddy bears. In a sense, every owner has adopted their NFT as their own Mr. Cuddles. The technical aspects of the club are nigh irrelevant for the club itself, but their development may play a major role in the future of NFTs. But later in the episode, I will get into it a little bit more and explain. Now, mega parties and club memberships aren't the only factors driving up Bored Ape's value. The members themselves have used their talents to build brands inside of the monkey tree. And I made that one up, so don't laugh too hard. Sarah, one of the few women who attended the party, developed a business of beautifying other Bored Apes. This beauty salon isn't affiliated with the base NFT, but it adds value to the brand as a whole. Jenkins 1498 has become an icon even among the apes. Being the lowest value chimp on the market, Jenkins embraced the role of being a valet and has all the dirty gossip on all the other chimps. Am I talking about an NFT like it's a real person? I am. But anyway, there are currently book deals in the works backed by the CAA Creative Artists Agency. Jenkins site, and yes, he has his own site, reads as follows. Jenkins the valet saw everything that happened at the yacht club and always practiced discretion. He snuck mistresses in through laundry carts, helped gain access to the merch closet. Heck, he even helped a patron steal a yacht. As the Basie has increased in popularity, the demand for Jenkins to spill the beans has exploded. Finally, Jenkins agreed to ape in and share his most wild story yet, and he needs your help. Jenkins enlisted Neil Strauss, a popular author known for writing edgy non-fictional books and ghostwriting memoirs as a primary writer. They will collect the crazy stories made up by the owners of their bored apes and the wild happenings of billionaires with nothing to do. There are NFTs made specifically for the right for apes to become characters and have a say in the creative process. There are writer rooms and yachts, the latter having a greater role in the storytelling process. Reporter Jeff Wilser asked Mr. Strauss in an extended query whether a surprise character would suddenly have an increase in financial value due to being a hero of a story. Strauss kind of denies the idea, citing the roles being dependent on who makes the highest investments. Now the stakes of this storytelling has the potential to be highly volatile for people who've invested thousands. The idea that literature could ultimately boom or bankrupt someone fits with the relatively risky nature tokens include. But the members weren't the only ones busy building in the metaverse. The founders have stayed busy building their brand into a completely social ecosystem. One of their main sources of branching out is adding the mutant serum, which allows their investors to transform their apes into mutants. One of the main draws of being an ape as opposed to another NFT was the owner's ability to modify it and have complete copyright ownership of it. This empowered buyers in a way that's unique, even for NFT owners. Many apes have taken the opportunity to add their personal flair to their token, but the creators didn't stop there. In the circle, they gave their members the chance to join the Bored Ape Kennel Club as well. Basie owners were given the chance to have a dog token, a companion for their unenthused friend. There is also an interactive graffiti wall, another outlet for members to interact with. Now, we won't get into what the developers expect there, but the people behind Basie also donated to an orangutan rescue, which is fitting and commendable. One of the few things I can say NFTs have done. 
Now, all of this has garnered the attention of major celebrities like Shaquille O'Neal, Steph Curry, Serena Williams, Mark Cuban, Jimmy Fallon, Paris Hilton, Snoop Dogg, Justin Bieber, and a lot more. Much of the increased value is attributed to popular figures like these buying and advertising their NFTs. There are people who gave negative reviews on Jimmy Fallon and Paris Hilton showing their apes on The Late Show, but there's no denying the benefit of showing an NFT in front of a live national audience. We can't predict what direction board apes and NFTs will go, but it's notable that their actions have shown promise in terms of marketability. But even with all this potential, it doesn't mean that everything is all good. So before we return to talk about some of the underbelly issues that we're looking at here, let's take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. And of course, when it's cold outside, the weather is miserable, going outside doesn't seem very fun. And sometimes when you have to go get groceries, maybe you're just hungry and don't wanna cook, it's even more miserable. But thankfully, DoorDash can help you out with that. It doesn't matter if you just want takeout from your favorite place, or maybe you forgot an item at the grocery store you really, really need, or just want some late night cookies or snacks, DoorDash can grab that for you. Or if you're like me, and you just got your HelloFresh box like I just did the other day, and you notice that they have a little bit of garlic in one of your items, but you are a garlic girl, if you feel me. And uh, my goofy ass while I was at the grocery store forgot to go get garlic. So I had to DoorDash garlic. DoorDash can help you out if you forget an important ingredient like garlic. And ordering is super easy and everything is left safely outside your door when you choose contactless delivery drop off. So for a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code casket. That's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code CASKET. Don't forget that's code CASKET for 25% off your first order with DoorDash. Subject to change, terms apply. Today's episode is also sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. I love being able to shop online while in my PJs, but I'm terrible at keeping track of promo codes and who has time for that? But now I have Honey to help find those precious money-saving codes for me. Honey is the free shopping tool that searches the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones to your cart. Now, recently I've been reducing how much I've been buying online. I've been really trying to hold back, but I've used Honey to help purchase furniture for the house when I needed a new rug from a furniture store. It's even helped me buy some supplies for the candle making business and of course clothing. So they're literally everywhere. And now Honey just doesn't work on your desktop alone. It also works on your iPhone. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on amazing savings. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. And I'd never recommend something I don't use. And I've been using Honey for years. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash casket. That's joinhoney.com slash casket. Though Basie has enjoyed massive success, the token has had its fair share of conflict and controversy. We've said many times that any money opportunity will bring scammers and fraudsters and Bored Ape is no different. Before we get into the scams and frauds revolving around the Bored Apes, we have to have a brief discussion about Web 3.0 and how that impacts them. Web 3 refers to a potential new iteration of the internet that runs on public blockchains, the record keeping technology best known for facilitating cryptocurrency transactions. The appeal of Web3 is that it's decentralized so that instead of users accessing the internet through services mediated by the likes of Google, Apple, or Facebook, it's the individuals themselves who own and control pieces of the internet. Web3 does not require permission, meaning that central authorities don't dictate who uses what services, nor is there a need for trust, referring to the idea that an intermediary does not need to facilitate virtual transactions between two or more parties. Web3 theoretically protects user privacy better as well because it's these authorities and intermediaries that are doing most of the data collection. Bored Apes is a large potential beneficiary of Web3 and there are some major implications behind decentralizing the internet. Decentralization is the act of transferring authority from a small number of large entities to numerous smaller entities. Many times we see this in regards to governments, but when it comes to the internet, it would mean that individuals have agency over their internet usage. In order to make Web3 possible, blockchains would have to be a major component. The drawback of the concept of Web3 is, as I understand, having full autonomy over your internet connection means there is no structure or support system protecting you from things like fraud, scams, or other malicious activities. For crypto enthusiasts, this would be considered a non-issue considering the complex inner workings of blockchains and hashing. Would it be too complex to hack in a system and monetize from it? Maybe, but scammers have proven that maybe they don't have to. Take Todd Kramer, for example. In late December, 2021, he took to Twitter to announce that all 15 of his bored apes were stolen, a value of $2.2 million. The hacker slipped into his wallet, took the NFTs and sold them to buyers. 
Kramer got a number of his NFTs back, but it sparked debate of whether decentralized internet assets were a good thing. There are people, mainly skeptics of crypto, who were not sympathetic of Mr. Kramer. Timothy McKimmy is another example. As explained by Timothy McKimmy, who goes by the nickname McKimmy on OpenSea, an NFT marketplace, in or around February 7th, 2022, a hacker exploited a security vulnerability to illegally access his wallet and sell his board Ape Yacht Club NFT to a third party for around $25.73, which is virtually the equivalent of giving away the token for free. In fact, right now, McKimmy's lost Ape is for sale for 225 Ethereum or $607,000 on OpenSea. And as McKimmy says in his lawsuit, the current owner has refused to give him back his Ape. He wants OpenSea to recoup the obviously lost value, but if we follow the rules of Web3, he shouldn't get anything. The same would go for Calvin Beckera, who was also conned out of all his board apes. He said that the alleged hackers posed as interested buyers in a Discord channel and pretended to help him fix a problem with his crypto wallet and then deceived him into choosing an option and took everything. In other words, it appears that the hackers tricked him into giving them ownership of the ape NFTs with a typical social engineering scheme. In response to the theft, Bekura has been asking people not to buy the NFTs from the hackers and requesting that marketplaces delist the stolen tokens. Recently, Twitter handle at MichaelKDCL, another member of the Ape community, discovered that someone was using their Ape as a profile picture and scamming the community. The scammer in question used the Ape's image to promote their own social media outlets, which garnered massive growth in followers. The Web3 scammer not only copied his board Ape, but they even created a fake collection on OpenSea and verified the collection with Twitter. He then confronted the scammer and demanded a public apology on the Twitter account. The scammer acquiesced, but it should be unnerving that I only copy pasted is a valid legal argument. Even with blockchains, hashes, and mountains of complex computer data, hackers and scammers remain the same. On a more lighthearted note, yet odd note, two bored ape copycats battle over, and I quote, which Basie knockoff was the real knockoff? P-A-Y-C and P-H-A-Y-C, I like the pun there, flipped the image of the board ape, which looks to the right, but otherwise kept them identical. P-H-A-Y-C in particular shows pride in copying the apes. I think the project is a satirical take on the current state of NFTs and members of the NFT community who might be taking the NFT market a little too seriously, said Twitter user root slash bin. I think this is one of the few times I've heard of someone being proud of plagiarizing an obvious faux pas in the creative world. OpenSea, the platform that sells board apes, banned both P-A-Y-C and P-H-A-Y-C from their platform. But wait, what can we call their work or their NFT then? I'll get back to you on that. But in either case, if the people behind Basey were to file an official legal complaint, these self-claimed fake tokens could make an argument under fair use. But there's very little legal precedent surrounding NFTs at all, let alone their copyright implications specifically. But what does the board ape yacht club have to do with NFTs at large? It turns out a lot. While the meteoric rise of the Basie is noteworthy in the crypto culture, other events going on with NFTs have widespread impact on the future of blockchains and the future role the internet will play. And just a warning, this section will reference traumatic coverage of a workplace murder. So if the subject is going to be too intense, feel free to skip nearly the rest of this episode. The entertainment industry, like video games and cinema, have experienced the idea of NFTs already. Independent filmmakers of the Prospect Project are trying to gain funds by getting customers to buy NFTs. But instead of just having an NFT, said customers would own, more or less, a portion of the movie itself, allowing them to have unfiltered interaction with every part of the creative process. Some would have the chance to be inserted as characters, as well as meet the actual filmmakers. If the film is successful, it could open the door for larger studios to market their creative ideas for NFTs. The video game industry, on the other hand, has received mixed reviews. Gaming company Ubisoft suffered a massive failure as their NFT project earned minimal returns on a headliner game, Ghost Recon Breakpoint. In just two months, the game garnered $400 worth of NFT revenue. It's debated whether that revenue comes as a profit or a loss too. The conversation surrounding tokens and video games in Split, seeing them as great opportunities or having ownership in games, while others believe that it's just a scam. The video game industry is particularly interesting for a few reasons. Play to earn games typically use crypto tokens instead of regular in-game currency, meaning that players can theoretically exchange their in-game earnings for real world currency. Microtransactions is a term for the use of financial transactions made for products in a game after the initial purchase or download. The flip side is the practicality of having NFTs is a product. We really only socially accepted microtransactions in the past 10 years. There are a number of games that have relatively short lifespans. Sports games and Call of Duty games come out nearly every year. What good will a rare skin, gun, or player be for a product that becomes obsolete in about 10 months? 
At that point, it would feel like the gaming company is just scamming their players. But there are other serious implications with NFTs. To gain context, we have to go back almost seven years. On August 26, 2015, Allison Parker and Adam Ward were fatally shot by a disgruntled former colleague while reporting near Roanoke. Broadcasted live, the horrifying footage quickly went viral, viewed millions of times on Facebook, YouTube, and other sites. To this day, it still gets tens of thousands of views despite the efforts by Parker's father, Andy, to eliminate the clips from the internet. On December of last year, after unsuccessfully keeping his daughter's tragic murder off of social media, Mr. Parker resorted to buying the footage of the murder as an NFT to claim a sort of copyright ownership to ban the footage. Before we get too far, Facebook and other social media outlets have claimed to take down the footage of any tragic event like losing a family member, and I can sympathize with those trying to protect their loved ones. That being said, there are places where the murder can still be viewed, and this token's goal is to make it illegal for social media to show it, as it would be copyright infringement. And I just, it, it kind of makes my brain turn to mush when I think about this whole situation. Like I know what I just said, and I know you know what you just heard, but to think about the fact that your kid died, it happened to be recorded, and the only way that you can actually fight from keeping this footage off the internet so people don't watch it is to buy it as an NFT. That's absolutely insane. And it's so, is it, is it right to say it's dystopian? It feels so weird that that's what you have to do to protect that kind of footage from being shown. It just doesn't seem to make sense. But I digress. With current law, social media outlets are mostly shielded from being held as liable for what their members post. And that makes sense. A platform as large as Twitter or Facebook or TikTok have millions of people all around the world who make posts 24 seven, and it'd be difficult to monitor all of that. One of the primary exceptions to this rule though is copyright law. For much of the internet, copyright infringement is a powerful law that can be backed up with costly lawsuits. Social media platforms only have the fair use clause under normal circumstances. So if they cannot prove that their material is transformative, they can be slapped with a sizable lawsuit. For victims of horrific images being distributed on the internet generally, unfortunately and inappropriately, copyright does end up being an effective tool, said Adam Massey, a partner at CA Goldberg PLLC, a prominent law firm that advised Parker. The power of copyright has context. Lenny Posner, the father of one of the tragic Sandy Hook shooting victims, effectively used copyright claims to virtually erase his son's picture from social media. And he cited the power of intellectual ownership as the most effective tool. We've already discussed how NFTs have a convoluted relationship with current copyright laws. Allowing Mr. Parker the ability to sue under copyright for owning an NFT would solidify the role of any token. As we discussed with Bored Apes and in the first NFT video, people are able to copy NFT owned pictures and use them as their own without any legal repercussions. If Mr. Parker succeeds, logic would demand the copyright power be granted to those who own NFTs. And what would become of classic copyright ownership if it has to clash with legally validated NFTs? A recent lawsuit between Nike and StockX LLC will provide some of the much needed answers to this question. Now, Nike is suing StockX for trademark and copyright infringement, and section four of the complaint goes into detail and says, specifically without Nike's authorization or approval, StockX is minting NFTs that prominently use Nike's trademarks, marketing those NFTs using Nike's goodwill and selling those NFTs at heavily inflated prices to unsuspecting consumers who believe or are likely to believe that those investable digital assets, as StockX calls them, are in fact authorized by Nike when they are not. Unlike its e-commerce business, which caters to buyers and sellers of goods originating from various companies, nearly all the NFTs minted by StockX to date are Nike branded NFTs, yet none of those NFTs originate from Nike. The expunging of a murder and a shoe copyright suit are drastically unrelated, but how one will resolve gives massive implications for the other, regardless of which reaches closure first. While the boundaries of copyright ownership are being tested and revisited, the concept of identification may evolve. We're talking about identity in strictly digital settings. In the same way that Bored Apes uses QR codes to verify a member, NFTs supposedly allow an individual complete ownership over their digital assets. It is enough of a concern about security that companies are including NFTs as part of their insurance policies, according to Forbes. The process is long and arduous requiring the owner of the NFT to research the metadata, verify the URL for the marketplace, as well as the product itself. If all those parameters are met, then companies can insure an NFT under certain circumstances. The United States IRS have also taken a special interest into NFTs. It's reported that $44 billion in taxes have gone unpaid from crypto owners. The IRS has already announced that they will take measures to avoid evasion. Tokens and crypto are still largely uncharted territory, but that won't stop governments from getting their tax allocations. If you own digital assets at all, I urge you to keep accurate and detailed records of what you do have. 
NFTs have the potential to be around for a long time and change our entire internet experience. There are many debates whether this will be positive or negative, but honestly, none of us know for sure. The Bored Ape Yacht Club shows enticing potential to grow and thrive. Their presence has given NFTs perceived legitimacy, and we're seeing examples all around of how NFTs can impact us directly. Regardless of what happens, we are most certainly in for one hell of a wild ride. And with all of that being said, that's where we're gonna end today's episode, taking a second look at NFTs and how the industry is evolving. If you learned something new from this episode, please make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And of course, I wanna give a big thank you to all of the patrons who support the show in various ways at various levels. You guys are all amazing. I love hanging out with you in the Discord server, seeing pictures of your pets, seeing what art projects you're working on. You guys are one of the sweetest bunches of people I've ever had the opportunity to chat with. So thank you all again for tuning in to today's episode. I know you can be doing a million and a half things in a day, and yet you chose about 30 minutes of your day spending it here with me. So thank you for that. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. So I hope you have a good one and uh, take care. Bye. Thank you.